That was Judge John Cooper speaking on Friday as he was handing out his ruling in the case of parents who were suing Governor Ron DeSantis because of his executive order that banned school boards, banned local school boards from enacting mandatory masking in schools. And we're speaking right now with Charles R. Gallagher III. He's an attorney in St. Petersburg. He was also one of the attorneys for those parents, representing those parents in their lawsuit and their victory against Governor Ron DeSantis. Welcome back to WMNF, Charles. Morning, Sean. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on. So what's your, what was your first reaction when you heard the judge? I mean, it, it was a really long ruling. He, he spoke for a really long time because I think what he wanted to do, and you can add to this if you'd like, but I think he was he didn't want to make it sound like he just made a decision willy-nilly. He really wanted to lay out what uh, what his decision was based on, and he did that over the course of hours. And so you could kind of tell kind of early on that he might be leaning this way because of how it was going. But how does that compare to how other judges give out their rulings, and what were you thinking when he was making this ruling? Well, I will say it was probably longer than you would expect in a normal hearing. This case is definitely one that's more important in terms of statewide impact and kind of long-term impact. So we, we were just thoroughly impressed with the care he took in the research and, and laying out the facts, talking about the evidence that was before him, that what led to his ruling. And um, you know, early on, we saw some tea leaves that might look like they were going our way. We were feeling good about that. And, and when he finally said, I'm not giving you relief on this count, that to us was our application. He's giving us relief on other counts. So we felt that, that was kind of a harbinger of uh, probably good things on, on the ruling. Uh, so, so yes, that probably was, um, I, I can't recall in the history of having maybe a longer oral pronouncement as part of a ruling. But again, this case is not uh, like any random run of the mill case. It's very, very unique. So I think he, he did what was appropriate. Um, and, and laying out with, with great care, with great certainty, all the facts he relied upon, what evidence he relied upon, him weighing the evidence, uh, looking at our experts versus their expert, uh, making findings of fact as to whatever danger was found to be by, by Delta. So um, we had good feelings when we heard some of the, the statements and, and thankfully they were um, you know, brought out with a ruling in our favor at the end of the day. And it wasn't the case where the judge just said, you know, I think it's in my personal opinion that masks are important or anything like that. He was basing it on the separation of powers between the legislature and the governor. And he said in this executive order, the governor violated the parents' bill of rights that, that was passed by the legislature. And the irony is in the case, one of the defenses asserted by the governor and by the defendants was a separation of powers defense. And we found that to be kind of ironic because at the end of the day, the separation of powers overreach of the governor was what led to this, this lawsuit and, and the findings in favor of the parents um, and, and prevailing on the lawsuit. So we thought that was a little bit ironic, but but yes, he, he again was, was very careful and methodical and going through what the Parents' Bill of Rights had entitled and then how the, uh, the executive order at issue became a separation of powers violation of itself um, and became uh, the unlawful pronouncement that the court ruled that it was. We're speaking with Charles R. Gallagher III. He's an attorney in St. Petersburg. He represented the the, the parents in the, their case against the governor when the governor's executive order said that local school boards could not uh, enact mask mandates to protect people from COVID-19. Tell us a little bit about these parents. Um, why were they so concerned? Why was this such a big deal to them that they'd actually sue the governor of the third largest state in the country? Certainly, certainly. So we had, we, we had a number of parents approach us and, and indicated their resolve and, and their concerns that forbidding the ability for individual school districts to make their own decisions and imposing this, this one size fits all approach to all 67 counties in the state of Florida uh, didn't, they felt, felt for them to be a violation of the constitution and felt for them to be a safety issue in terms of schools that if you have uh, schools in certain counties where the, the rates are through the roof, uh, prohibiting them from having a, a mask mandate with only medical opt out, put their kids in peril, put their kids in risk. And, and these parents gave great testimony during the uh, the trial. One of the parents uh, would come to school every day at lunch and have lunch with her kids because she did not want to have her, her, her kids in a co-mingled environment of masks and not masks for safety purposes. One of the other parents talked about when she went to school uh, for the orientation that nobody was wearing masks, staff, teachers, 
students, nobody was wearing masks at all. And she had extreme concern and peril for, for her kids in the school system. Um, and, 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 and of course, she said that the, the numbers that were coming out from the CDC metrics and such supported that. We, you know, we, we had a positivity rate of late of 20% of for pediatric um, you know, students and patients. And it's the same one out of every four kids has positive for COVID. Uh, so uh, I think that, that that was significant for them that, that you had these areas of impact where the whole entire state was under that, that red classification of being in a hot zone. So they were all concerned for their, their student safety and really for the safety of all students in the school systems. We heard the governor yesterday say that he is going to appeal this ruling. Um, I heard from our, our reporter, Daniel, spoke to one of your colleagues the other day who said that your case is rock solid. If they appeal, we're going to win it on the merits. But what, what are your thoughts about an appeal? Um, I'm sure you're, you're confident enough to say that you're going to win, but what's, tell us more. What are, what's the, how would you break down the appeal? What, sure. what, what, how, the governor is going to appeal. How are you going to counter that? Sure. And, and, and the first thing out of the box is on the issue of appealing a trial court ruling. A, a party can't appeal a ruling because they don't like it because it didn't go their way, there's gotta be some underlying legal error on the part of the court or the judge. So the judge has to make some mistake in the case for there to be an appeal right for, uh, for a party. So out of the box, we think that we, we haven't seen and we haven't evaluated any legal errors made by the trial court that would support an appeal. Can they go ahead and file an appeal? They pay their filing fee, they file a notice of appeal, sure they can. Uh, but on the, on the merits, you must have some underlying uh, error or mistake by the trial court to support that. Um, so we fully expect them to go ahead and appeal it. They were they were saying they were going to appeal it within seconds of the announcement. So I, hard, hard to say what they were evaluating as legal error. But at that point, they would file an initial brief with with, a, with the court, the first ECA, or, or potentially even the first, even the Supreme Court. This is one of those cases where you could have an elevation for the Supreme Court, much like you had in the election case of 2000. Uh, 2000. <laughs> so that's possible. But but they may go ahead and go to the first ECA. That was what happened last year in the school reopening case. It's different facts, but they, we're, we're, we're thinking they'll do one or the other. At that point, the court will, will take their brief, will file an answer brief to it, and they have to point out where the court made that legal error at the trial court level and why that legal error pr provides them with the right to, to remand, to overturn, to vacate the uh, trial court ruling. So again, we feel pretty confident with the, the ruling we were given. Um, it, and one of the things that, that has been important about that, that two hour plus oral pronouncement was it laid out the basis for the decision. There was nothing, there was nothing that was you know, general about it, but everyone knows why the court ruled the way the court did. He made detailed findings of fact, he made detailed conclusions of law there. And, and, and I reconciled that as kind of a bulletproof order at the end of the day, yes, that will be reduced to a more brief uh, written order that is signed by the, the judge, and that will be the, the actual document that, that's appealed. But the underlying ruling for that, that length of time, was, was so detailed for a reason. And that reason was to, we, we, we believe, you know, support and sustain the trial court's uh, findings and rulings. And we think that that ruling uh, was, was one that would be bulletproof to an appeal. We're speaking with Charles Gallagher III, an attorney in St. Petersburg who represented the parents who sued the governor over the executive order that forbid school boards from enacting mask mandates. You're listening to WMNF Tampa. It's 1041 in the morning. This is 88.5 FM. I'm Sean Canan. And so, Charles, let me ask you this about the uh, the, the specifics of that the judge mentioned, these studies that the, the governor and his people who support him bring up all the time. There's this Brown University study, and there was this study out of Georgia, and all the time, including even in court, the governor and his lawyers said that this, the, these studies, the Brown University and the Georgia study, indicate that children aren't safe wearing masks. But the judge read the full studies, and he scolded the governor and his team for not doing so. What did the judge say these studies actually said? So uh, the, the expert used by the state is a, a gentleman named Dr. Jay Bhattacharya out of Stanford. And he's a researcher. Um, he's a professor of some health economics courses at Stanford. Um, when you speak to him and, and cross-examine him, he, he clearly admits he's not a practicing physician. He's never treated a patient in his entire career. Um, he's never treated anyone with COVID. And his entire existence with COVID is to um, review the research of others and conduct some research in a few isolated examples uh, out in California and, and draw opinions on that. And, and he was the author of this great Barrington Declaration, which was a um, kind of a manifesto by three 
I would say outlier type experts, doctors and the like, saying that the only way to really um, to, to beat this whole COVID thing is to have uh, you know pop populations that are that are very uh, susceptible to illness, such as elderly folks and the like, to have them you know be taken care of. But for everybody else, a herd immunity would be the way to go. And, and this was a, a study that was criticized by Fauci, by everybody from uh, the CDC, and really found to be kind of outside the norm in terms of medicine. The court looked at all those studies, and and, Ms., and Dr. Bhattacharya's affidavit was a 900-page submission. He had a, a 18-page affidavit with about 980 pages of, of studies that are attached to that. Every one of those studies was conducted prior to the existence of Delta. And one of the themes of the case was that Delta is different. You know, last year we were fortunate to have a COVID alpha strain or COVID Wuhan strain, the initial strain, that did not affect children much and was not as high a transmissibility rate and a high a viral load. All those things were not present with Delta, where you have, again, a, a transmissibility rate, you know, the r naughts we talked about with, with the scientists and such, and meaning that if the old COVID variant had an r naught of one or two, meaning one person would infect one or two people, the current r naught would be in a six to eight range, so a person infected would infect six to eight people. So the fact that it spread so fast and has a high yield rate uh, was was something the court found very important, and and he was very very careful with. I think I think he read every word of every page of every document um, in this case, and and I'm, I'm sitting behind probably three or four you know three foot high stacks of, of binders of documents, and I, I'm certain he read everything probably more than once, uh, and he was was looking at the selective. Um, uh, picking out of phrases and issues in the documents by the defense. And I think he found a lot of concern with that, where they were trying to, to string cite and miscite and misquote things. The very documents which they were using, uh, when he read them in totality, he found it to have significant um, points for the plaintiffs, that, that, that you had problems in there with Delta. So he uh, did a real good job in evaluating all that uh, medical testimony, medical expert testimony, as well as documents. Um, and, and, and hearing from our experts, our, our doctors that treat patients every day that are pediatric pulmonologists, pediatric infectious disease doctors, hospitalists, people that work in the hospital all the time, I think he found that to be very, very um, compelling in terms of his evaluation. And this Brown study specifically says, <laughs> it, it don't, we, we are not saying that masks um, aren't able to protect kids, they actually do protect kids. The, the Brown study was something cited in the executive order. And when you actually evaluate the Brown study in the current form of it, first of all, it was never peer reviewed. This is a, it was a preprint, early draft out. They're trying to solicit peer review for it. But then the authors of the study themselves uh, concede that there was no data used for the study that is Delta data. And, and they walked back nearly all the conclusions of the study um, and, and receded from the idea that masks weren't helpful and kids weren't getting COVID. So the underlying support for that executive order was essentially excised out of uh, the order itself with, with no support for it. So the other studies that were cited also, we, we went through every one of the studies that was cited by Dr. Bhattacharya. Every one of the studies cited was a pre-Delta study. So these all talk about uh, you know, again, last school year, last summer, when you had uh, less of, of a prevalence and it was COVID alpha. So all those were really comparing apples to oranges with this year's Delta variant. Our guest is Charles R. Gallagher III, an attorney in St. Petersburg, also the plaintiff's attorney for the parents who schooled, who, the parents who sued, that is, the governor of the state of Florida for his executive order that forbid school districts from enacting mask mandates. And you're listening to WMNF 88.5 FM. I'm going to read this uh, two, about two or three sentences from the Florida Phoenix. It says, Florida is one of only five states that has not submitted a state plan for COVID relief to the U.S. Department of Education, holding up billions in federal funds to help the Florida education system recover from the impacts of COVID-19 in schools. These funds could be used to address learning loss among students due to an irregular school year, ensure safe and sanitary schools as COVID remains a threat in the classroom and provide mental health services to help students deal with the trauma of learning through a pandemic. I know this is outside, <clears throat> excuse me, outside the, uh, the scope of this, your trial, but um, I don't know, it just seems like Florida could be doing more instead of, uh, you know, it's, it's worrying about these mask mandates more than it is about actually getting money to schools to fight to help protect kids from COVID. Any thoughts on that? And there appears to be this just over and over double down by the administration on efforts, reasonable efforts 
to intercede and stop this problem. There, there simply would really be no reason why you wouldn't want to obtain those funds. Um, and, and there are recent statements from the governor's office about that there was a issue on giving funds to the um, giving funds to the um, you know, back to the um, to the cities and cities that people need them. So that's a problem. I don't understand why there would be any issue relative to that. Um, you know, help out the schools, help out the citizens and students with those funds. That they could use them. And the, also on that note, kind of the federal government announced that it's investigating five Republican led states that banned mask requirements because those policies could mean discrimination against students who have disabilities or health issues. That's according to Axios. But Florida isn't one of those states now, I think maybe because of this judge's ruling. But what are, what are your thoughts on that idea that it's, it could be discrimination against students who have disabilities or health issues when you ban mask mandates? And I, I agree with you. I think that was one of the reasons why the DOH, the federal DOH, uh, did not enter into Florida right now. I think they also were hesitant to do it in Texas, given that Texas has uh, rulings that have overruled mask mandate uh, bans. But I, I would agree with the department, the Federal Department of Health, that you probably have some issues of civil rights concerns here, where children that have uh, identifiable, diagnosed health issues, disabilities alike, would be under IEPs, you know, plans that, that, that provide them a certain kind of assistance. If they're being asked to go into a school setting that is not mandatory mask with this medical opt out and exposing them to a, a greater risk of peril, um, students that have asthma and other mm -hmm. kinds of respiratory issues are at a greater risk. And some of those students would have other issues where they couldn't wear masks. So you definitely have an intersection where the federal government would be able to step in and assist in this, this effort. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we heard from many of our, 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 our witnesses, our, our parents, and um, all of the state's parents actually had some identifiable health concerns, some disability, which was which was ironic because you would have thought they would go the other way and have otherwise not non um, health related folks testify. And then with regard to our uh, witnesses as well, you know, some of our witnesses had children that had health issues as well. They they would be losing spots if they don't come to the brick and mortar class. Um, and losing potential um, status for the, the next school year. So if you don't, if, if a use it or lose it element to some of these things, and right now we were told that the Florida virtual school, which would be an alternative for them, could stop taking, stop taking anybody at all. And there had been waiting lists for it, and, and, and a lot of the programs were actually entirely closed out. So there, there was no option for these folks aside from homeschooling <laughs> and being in the home setting. So as a result of that, we think that the, the DOH is well suited to get involved and it will be a, a additional help of, of, of those issues. Our guest is Charles R. Gallagher III, an attorney in St. Petersburg. And Charles, I don't know, do you have to go or can you, do you want to stick out the rest I'm of the I'm with you. Welcome okay. to me. <laughs> All right. Fantastic. He represented the parents who sued the governor over his executive order that banned mask mandates in schools, uh, banned mask mandates by school districts, local school districts. So some of the, I, I, I'm, this is a question, are some of your um, parents in the Pinellas School District, which still does not have a mask mandate, and if so, are do you know what their plan is as far as uh, petitioning, I guess, their local school board to to enact one? So they have been active in requesting the Pinellas County School Board to take notice of the uh, of Judge Cooper's ruling, and the response they've received is that uh, we understand the rulings by the court. We're waiting for the written order before we really reevaluate, but there's been great resistance that we found from Pinellas. Um, if you look, the superintendent there was actually part of the DeSantis, one of the DeSantis reopening task forces. Uh, so there's been some allegations about maybe some, some, some political issues or why they're precluding that. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what we've heard from parents asserting some concerns. Uh, so those parents uh, are contemplating if there is not going to be an action by the school board um, after this written order is memorialized, which really should be in the next few days, hopefully, uh, they're contemplating some action themselves um, as to the school board. So uh, they're, they're not going to kind of sit idly by and let them uh, continue to uh, really buck the tide of all the other surrounding counties and large counties in the state to protect the kids of, of the schools. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the reopening task force because um, that's the goal. I think that's, it's safe to say that that's the goal of everyone. Everyone wants to have kids be able to learn in school classrooms. And so if you're, it seems like if you're in favor of having kids in classrooms learning, you would want to do that in the way that protects the most people, which 
is universal masking. So it's almost like, how is it, how is it that the people who want to send kids back to school, which is, I think, everyone, yes. uh, it seems like that they're hurting their own cause by, by um, keeping mask mandates off the table. But to, to use the words of a great uh, sci-fi show, it's, it's simply illogical. <laughs> there, there's no reason why you would support the idea of, of banning mask mandates. You know, last school year, that was the norm. We had mask mandates in schools and, and you had correspondingly good numbers. Yes, that was under COVID alpha, COVID Wuhan, a little different, different beast in terms of the strain, but that worked in terms of last year's, last year's school year. And everybody to a T wants students in brick and mortar schools. You're gonna gain more from education processes. You're gonna have socialization issues. Everything about it is positive. There's really nothing about it at all. So why would you remove a layer of protection and, and, and basically have the student population in a much more perilous, dangerous place where they're going to have a, a higher likelihood of conducting it, contracting COVID. Um, as we sit right now, one, you know, I think last week's numbers had, one of the states had a 40% positivity rate. I mean, many of the counties in the, in, in the state, one of the counties had a 40% rate. Many of the counties are in the 30s, you know, in, in, in the high 30s and 30s. And if you're not in the 30s, you're probably in the 20s. Uh, I think there were only maybe two or three that I recall seeing that were below 20s. So these are numbers we didn't have last year. We had numbers in the, the teens and people were talking about that being excessive. To have a, to have a district and the 40% positivity rate shocks the mind and, and how that would be uh, not remedied with mandatory masking. So yes, that's, it's concerning why you would have this goal defeated by a very simple process. And turning it into a political animal, you know, the, the, the whole messaging has been about, you know, parent choice, parent choice, parent choice, you know, nothing about this is parent choice. Every one of our experts to a T said, this is a public health issue, nothing more. I guess this is Charles R. Gallagher III, an attorney in St. Petersburg who represented parents who sued the governor over his executive order to ban mask mandates by local school districts. I'm going to put a caller on the air, if you don't mind, Charles. Uh, this is Sharon in Pasco. Hi, Sharon, what would you like to say? Thank you for the show. Um, yeah, I've been following this. Um, I'm, um, I have a lot of friends and teachers that are teachers. Um, my question, and I guess I, I, I'm just confused about the Department of Education um, of Florida. And um, I, I, I don't understand how the Department of Education can be so um, so persuaded by the governor and not taking account um, school board, not taking account and asking teachers how they feel about it. And um, I, I just find it very essential that the Department of Education does not Well, let's let's um, thank you for the question, Sharon. I'm going to ask our guest, Charles Gallagher, the attorney here, uh, his opinion. And I'm going to piggyback on that, if you don't mind, so that I don't forget the second part of my question, which I think dovetails with Sharon's. And that's the order that came out a couple of weeks ago from the Department of Education that kind of opened the door for this mandatory masking with a medical opt out or with, I guess, it, maybe it said only opt out. So what would you say, Charles, to Sharon's question about the Department of Education and Richard Corcoran? So they are certainly duty bound to act in the best interest of schools and students. And what they're doing does not appear to comport with that, that guideline, that directive. Uh, the idea that they are really partnering up in full force on, on a political issue, as opposed to actions that would, that would serve to protect the students of Florida, again, does not make a lot of sense in terms of uh, the, their, their utility. I think you heard from uh, Jacob Olivia, the chancellor from uh, the school system in Florida on, on direct exam and cross exam. And, and what came out there was actually really concerning and that he, there was not a, a very good global view of, of safety and how to protect students best under Florida's you know, system of education. 
um, there, there was a, what I found to be a whole lot of apathy there and indifference to, to the, um, the real needs of students and schools um, in favor of maybe uh, political posturing um, as opposed to you know, taking care of the kids. So yes, that was concerning. Uh, I definitely think that, that that doesn't make a lot of sense why you would place those interests above those of kids in the schools to, to remain safe and to remain uh, you know, as, as well insulated from COVID spread as possible. So definitely concerned there and, and, and we didn't understand that. Uh, but I think that, that you know, it, it shows through, this has become more of a political issue um, in terms of the uh, posturing out there by, by, by those state departments that it really should be. We're talking about executing policies for safe schools and governing schools and it's going way beyond that. And the Secretary of Education essentially answers to the governor really only, um, despite the, Sharon's concerns that he maybe should concern himself about educators and, and students. Also, do you have any thoughts about that order? My question about that order that came out a few weeks ago that may have opened up the door for opt-outs? Sure. So, and, and I think really what that what our experts are saying, and, and, and they've said kind of the theme is that a, a mandatory masking scenario with parent opt out is not mandatory masking. Uh, we heard more of high percentages of folks masking out for no good reason, and, and that leaves students in that same commingled vulnerable population. So, absolutely, there are people that, that require medical exemptions, and, and you heard three of them as the defense expert, the, the defense fact witnesses at trial, and the court eloquently said, uh, I, I really think that you all all qualify for medical opt-outs, and, and your doctors can help you achieve that. So those folks, were, no one's talking about those folks. We're talking about the, the ideological reasons of, of not masking, and there was a curious uh, profile by, uh, by John Oliver's uh, show a couple weeks ago, and they, were, they interviewed a father, and the father was um, telling his child, the child liked to wear a mask. He felt like he was you know, a superhero wearing a mask. And the father told the kid, don't say you like doing that. Don't say that. You know, and the father's also comments were, you know, I'm an American. We don't have to do anything that we're not told to do. We're told to do. So this is defiance, you know, for the greater good. But then telling his kid who was doing it and enjoying doing it, don't do it. So frustrating to have that be inserted into this whole calculus of, of people choosing for no reason not to wear masks as some statement or as some ideological basis that, that was, again, there was a window under that order that, that, that allowed that. Charles Gallagher the third. we have about a minute or so left in the show, but what should we expect for the next steps? We'll, we'll probably get the judge's order in writing this week, and then what? So yes, I, I, the expectation is may, maybe late today, maybe tomorrow, maybe midday tomorrow, there'll be a signed order. As soon as that order is, is signed, I would expect the state to file a notice of appeal. Um, thereafter, as, as quickly as that's filed, we're gonna file a motion to vacate the appellate court stays effect of a trial court order. And so what, what that basically means kind of in lay terms is uh, when they file their appeal, the, 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 appellate, the appellate court has jurisdiction over it and that order is kind of frozen, so to speak. We're gonna ask the trial court to, to ensure that the order stays in place pending the appeals resolution so that there's protection during this whole time. And we're hopeful the court would, would consider that and, and grant that motion to vacate the stay so that we can keep that protection in place for school boards. Uh, thereafter, there would be a, a full on appeal with briefs, probably oral argument, and a, a whole longer time frame schedule than the, the quick filing and trial that we had to date. Well, Char Charles, thanks so much for coming back on WMNF. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. All the best. Have a great one. All right. Thank you. You too. Charles Gallagher III is an attorney in St. Petersburg. He represented the plaintiffs in the, their lawsuit against the Governor Ron DeSantis who enacted an executive order against school boards enacting mandatory masking. Well, thanks to Barbara Fling for answering our phones today. I'm Sean Canan. Stay tuned now for Janelle Irwin in her new time. That's 11 o'clock on Tuesday mornings, and that's coming up after NPR headlines. You're listening to WMNF Tampa, St. Petersburg, Sarasota, Lakeland, Bradenton, and Gulfport. Thanks so much for listening to WMNF. Stay tuned. <laughs>